Yo, yo, welcome to another episode of the Super Team Podcast. Today we have, why are you laughing, Cash? Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Super Team Podcast. <laughs> you do the intro. You do it. You do it. What are we, what are we even calling it? Tell me the name. I don't know. You tell us. You are the host now. Yeah, by you, you tell. Hello, hello, hello. This is welcome to Super Team. Random things we thought were cool on Twitter. Week of August. Anyway. Wow. <laughs> Did you have a footnote to that title? <laughs> Week of August, 22nd. We're doing a new thing on the podcast this week. We don't have a guest, but instead, we are going to discuss just the most interesting things we found on crypto Twitter. So we're going to begin. Akshay, what did you read this week on crypto Twitter and why did you find it was interesting? Zeneca33 says, growing... Increasingly more convinced that zero creator royalties is inevitable, sadly. Projects and creators should be proactively thinking about alternative revenue models. We certainly are at the ZA. I don't know what ZA means. Culturally, we must fight for artist royalties. At least 10K projects are different. All right, Cash, you pick this. Do you want to talk about why this is interesting? Yeah, I think this is super fun. So when NFTs first came on the scene, the normal argument from every like VC or thought leader or whatever else it was, was, oh, now artists can monetize in perpetuity. Right now in the real world, if you sell a painting, you get a chunk of the first sale. And then after that, you never get another chunk. Won't this be so much better? We'll have perpetual artist royalties. Uh, and it sounds very cool. And as like an art lover, I think that's very cool. But the truth is that's not how the tech works. Already right now in the last few weeks, we've seen the launch of a few new platforms. Yaw Marketplace is one on Solana and then Pseudo um, on the EVM kind of world, both of which are NFT marketplaces that remove artist royalties. It turns out that those royalties are not like as mandated as you might think they are. To clarify, yeah. since it seems a lot of people aren't aware, creator royalties are not enforceable in smart contracts. And that's what I mean by it seeming inevitable. They're going to zero for the most part. They're not, I didn't even know that they're not enforceable in smart contracts. I thought the whole point of smart contracts was that code is law. Wait, where? Yeah. how are they enforced then? They're not enforced. That's the whole thing. Wait, right? so, so how does, like, done at the open sea level or? Yeah, that's right. It's held at the open sea level. It's the marketplaces themselves that decide whether to honor it or not. So right now, when you create an NFT, right, if I go to whatever, like Metaplex and use them to create some NFT, I get to program it and say, I want 10% of all future sales of this, right? That's the royalty. Mm. It turns out that that, when you're saying that, that's more of like a suggestion. It's not an actual requirement. And you can overstep that suggestion and just set that to zero if you want to. I just, yeah. If you're an artist, you're doomed to be poor. No, nothing can be done about it. <laughs> Tanmay, I'd, I'd be I'd be interested in turning our contract into a suggestion if you're open to it. <laughs> so this is a tweet from uh, from Miles that I thought was interesting, talking about kind of like the the new ETH merge drama. Okay, here's the major problem, right? ETH miners they don't want to switch to proof of stake because they spent all of this money on these mining rigs for the proof of work version of Ethereum, right? So they've decided to create a fork of Ethereum, basically a copycat of Ethereum that still uses proof of work. Uh, it's easier to think about this kind of like two roads, right? So like on the one road, you have proof of stake ETH, which is like normal ETH that we all know and love. The miners are creating a sep separate road called proof of work ETH, uh, and they're trying to get people to switch over to that one to kind of like go to the second road here, right? On the proof of work fork, all the same assets are going to exist, right? So there will be uh, the normal board ape on the proof of stake chain that is like the one that we normally believe exists and it matters. And then there will also be a proof of work uh, board ape on the proof of work ETH network, right? So if you owned two ETH on the proof of stake chain, if you just own two ETH right now, you will also own two ETH on the proof of work chain. And the question is, which of these board apes is actually worth anything? Or more generally, which ETH has value, the proof of stake version or the proof of work version? Most of it is down to social consensus, right? If we as users continue to agree that actually proof of stake is cool and we do want to use that chain, then there's no value in the proof of work version. However, there is one select asset which really has all of the power here. And that's why I like this tweet, right? So it says, first issue, ETH miners are contentiously preserving the proof of work chain, right? All of the people that are mining on proof of work don't want to switch to proof of stake. Yeah. Because they'll have no more money. Right. But DeFi and stables are integral to Ethereum's value proposition, right? The future of finance, all that kind of stuff. Right. Issuers like USDC effectively get to select the chain which wins and which collapses. Uh, this is the crazy. Uh, if USDC says we are not going to recognize any USDC on the proof of stake chain, the proof oh, of stake is dead on. Yeah. 
Uh-huh. It all depends on what proof of, what USDC wants to do, because without USDC, the entire Jenga tower collapses, right? And so we are discovering in real time that a single centralized US company, which is under full regulation from the SEC and others, gets to really decide the future of which chain works and which ones don't. But like if they decide not to, that's isn't that just creating competition? Like someone else will show up and they'll be like, yo, we'll we'll fill fill plug this hole. And isn't like the proof of work change, isn't that going to be called Ethereum Classic? We already have Ethereum Classic, which is the pack. Uh, This one will be, uh, I think it's ETHW is what they're calling it for ETH proof of work. Yeah, but so in the long run, absolutely. I know a new competitor will emerge and whatever else. But until then, there's like $60 billion or some gigantic number like that of USDC that does exist, that has real value, that needs to be figured out in the short term, right? So effectively, USDC and future companies like it get to choose which uh, chains can be forked and which ones can't. So this whole idea that we have in crypto, although everything is forkable, this is what preserves the right to exit, uh, that Balaji and others have talked a lot about, turns out that might not actually exist in the way that we thought it did. Well, but I think this is this is uh, like a, all of these stress tests are good, right? Because it will force decisions that in the long term will make reliance on them much less, um, you know, important. I think the same thing happened with Bitmain and stuff back in when Bitcoin forked in 2017 and you had the four or 2016 and you had the fork wars and there were some miners who had a disproportionate share of the Bitcoin mining network that just don't have as much anymore as the network has grown. So um hopefully this this is why um, all my assets are on binance smart chain this is the main <laughs> that's smart <laughs> Tanmay. that's just, like just, uh, you, why, you, you should you should tweet this actually so more people can make the right financial decision here <laughs> okay so let's set aside this usdc getting to choose the next chain and what that means for forking in the future set that aside entirely the next problem becomes around these ofac sanctions so people who are watching this probably saw that tornado cash which is a cryptocurrency mixing service got sanctioned by ofac which is a u.s governmental agency under the department of treasury saying that hey anyone that uses this is cut off from the u.s financial system which means anything that transacts in dollars or any institution like a bank or a payment gateway that uses dollars can no longer service these people the trick of it is what happens to the validators. So in a proof of stake future for Ethereum, which again is going to happen in a few weeks, uh, a lot of the validators are going to be centralized companies that are subject to OFAC type regulations, right? Coinbase is a, the best example here. Lido right. Finance is potentially another right. one. If those validators decide because they're forced to, forced to by OFAC to not include any transactions done by these OFAC sanctioned wallet addresses, That creates censorship at the base layer, right? Base layer protocol censorship means like in the way that the actual network runs, it is fundamentally censorable if it is dependent on these large centralized players. You know, it's like how when China banned proof of work miners, um, you know, the hash rate in Bitcoin fell, but over time it picked up again because it just got geographically distributed. Mm. I think the every time there's a single point of failure that catalyzes more decentralization, like Credible decentralization has always been, at least like in in the examples that I just stated, have always come as a response, not as a proactive measure. And most of the proactive stuff tends to be decent, like decentralization LARP. And so this is actually pretty cool because what Brian Armstrong said in response to somebody asking him whether he would, whether Coinbase would support an OFAC compliant or whether Coinbase would be compliant with OFAC if they were running a validator, he actually said they will suspend the staking service rather than, you know, partake in censorship or the base layer which is pretty cool, right? That shows their commitment to decentralization. Uh, can, I, can I say one more fun, but scary, or one scary, but potentially interesting future that this could lead to as well to build on this, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's say Coinbase and them decide they don't want to do uh, the validation uh, under the censorship of MOFAC, right? Mm-hmm. The question is, you know, the long run future for Ethereum that I think the three of us kind of see and, and many others as well is that it becomes kind of the base settlement layer for large and very important and expensive transactions where your security really matters, right? Since ETH is the most secure and most decentralized network in one sense. Uh, how do banks and the rest of them ever use Ethereum if they know that by using Ethereum, they are violating OFAC sanctions laws, right? You can very easily imagine a regulatory future in the US in particular, where any bank is said like, hey, you can use it, but just make sure that people are KYC'd and there's no OFAC violations, et cetera. In that kind of world, what we would expect to see would be an OFAC fork of Ethereum, where all the validators do take on the censorship and say that, hey, if you're blacklisted, you can't use this, everything else works as normal. 
And if that is the case, that is the chain that you would expect these large institutions to adopt, right? Because that's the only one that they can from a regulatory and compliance angle. So then you have this fragmentation happening, right? Where all of the kind of like fun decentralized nerds and kind of black market use cases are using main Ethereum. And then all of these financial institutions are using OFAC Ethereum. You don't have composability between the two. You lose out on a bunch of the other kind of crypto DeFi benefits that you might want to see. And it overall reduces the value proposition of ETH in the long run if banks are all going to be using an OFAC ETH uh, in the future. Uh, new one here, some, some hot fire coming out of Canada. They're stepping into the regulation game in the funniest, most Canadian way possible. Uh, so now they are limits on how many shit coins you can buy in Canada, which is you know, maybe good for some, but broadly a pretty terrible policy. Um, only can buy up to $30,000 of crypto a year, unless it is one of four specific coins. Bitcoin and Ethereum obviously makes sense. The second two are amazing. The other two crypto coins that you can buy with unlimited exposure are Bitcoin Cash and Litecoin. These are the four that the Canadian government says these are safe. Anybody should have unlimited access to these. What? <laughs> Litecoin? This is real. Litecoin and Bitcoin Cash, unlimited access. But also like this will just like shit coins, like because of unit bias, they're the biggest, like the biggest hit here will be just the number of trades will be lower, right? Like. They're just making it unnecessarily difficult. Why they're making it so easy to buy Litecoin and Bitcoin Cash, I have no idea whatsoever. And by the way, if you'll notice, it's like specific provinces, which are like states in Canada that are impacted by this and then other ones aren't. So if you just like walk across the border to the next state over, immediately you can buy unlimited, uh, you know, you know X. Cash, I don't know if you know this cash, but like, but there are some states in India where there's like an alcohol ban. The difference is in like, if you're buying mm -hmm. alcohol, you have to physically go over there, get somebody to come to you. If you're like buying crypto, you can do it, whether your laptop is there or over in the next state over, just get a VPN and say that I'm now in Alberta. And then you're like, oh, avoiding the regulations. So just to be clear, Cash said that his uh, social security number <laughs> is, uh... <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a tweet by CNBC correspondent where they talk about FTX's finances and growth in 2021. Their revenue jumped by a thousand percent. So they basically grew tenfold last year. They're already profitable with 27% operating margins. Nuts. Most of the business comes from outside the US on derivative products. And they have the global footprint go growing through M&A. You know, they're acquiring all these smaller exchanges and things like this outside the, U uh, the US. What I thought was interesting was, you know, you kind of can put a number on how much, how much bigger FTX got in the last year um, at the peak of the bull market. Uh, importantly, the fact that a lot of their uh, revenue comes from outside of the US. And so, you know, Coinbase has effectively shrunk their business from due to various reasons outside the US. And uh, that may have been a lost opportunity for them, given that they were earlier in the, in the, in the game. There's two kind of like key lessons in this, which are interesting. One is I think FTX kept their team size really small, small. right? Mm. And they get so much work, more work done. Whereas uh, Coinbase, before they laid off people, had a bloated organization, um, you know, they and they were based out of the US. So they were responding in many ways to regulatory threats outside of the US in the same way that they would respond in the US, simply because you had executives who are Americans who are kind of like applying the, the lens of the US regulations on the rest of the world. So you kind of ended up making really risk averse decisions everywhere outside the US as well. Whereas if you see what Binance and FTX did, they kind of hived off the US business into a separate entity with its own leadership and its own policies, its own employees, and then took a bunch of you know, idiosyncratic risks outside the US, mm. right? Which is why they just went vertical in, in the last two years, whereas Coinbase did not. A question for the crypto critics. If crypto has zero utility, why are 19 of the top 20 economies by crypto adoption uh, developing countries with significantly lower as a financial freedom, economic equality, and law. If you take a look at this list where crypto is actually being used and actually taking off, you will find uh, it is largely ascending markets where people are actually using this. This fits in nicely to the previous thing with FTX, by the way. FTX is non-US focused, makes sense, because that is where we're seeing just thirsty, thirsty demand uh, for crypto and the value it provides. There's a yeah. counter to this. Open the sheet again, Akshay. The right one. The right one. Uh, I mean, one way of looking at it is oh, financial freedom, etc. The other way of looking at it is just a lot of like, like of course, uh, barring like Ukraine, Russia, uh, Singapore, like a lot of these countries are also poor. One, two, um, like the volatile asset is more attractive. 
in in a lot of the poorer countries like for example india is on this list you can't take crypto out of an exchange in india interestingly tanmay there is a follow up tweet which addresses oh. the exact point that you made which i just saw and take if you think this. this is just a desperate wish for poorer communities for gambling like asymmetric returns and fast wealth why do so many people in this countries value crypto as means of transaction and inflation hedge really Wow. I mean, some of these, uh, like like Nigeria and uh, South Africa, India, we, like the, the inflation rates are incredibly high. Like Nigeria is all like sixteen, seventeen percent, right? Like that's pretty. Incredible. Bro, this is thirty percent of the seven percent of India that owns crypto. There's just no way these many people even know what inflation hedge would mean. It's it's a India. it's a survey of people who own crypto are uh, asked why they own what they own and out of which thirty percent or so answered that they do so because they think it's a hedge against inflation. By the way, True. this hedge against inflation thing is uh, it, it seems to be consensus opinion on Twitter. At least I haven't seen it be challenged very publicly that Bitcoin did not hold up to be a hedge against inflation. No, and, it's correlated to the markets, right? Like yeah, but like, is it aren't markets forward looking? And if inflation, like if a, the government prints a bunch of money, Bitcoin kind of did its job by running up from whatever three and a half thousand to sixty nine thousand. And then, sure, it corrected back down or whatever. But I think it would be useful to look at how gold ran in the nineteen seventies. On the first signs of inflation, everything draws down, right? Mm. Uh, but the job of the asset was to front run what was going to happen, right? Like you mm. know, markets are forward looking, so. Um, I don't know why that doesn't get brought up more, but maybe I'm mm. missing something. The other thing, cash, yeah. is that most users in India, they're like India is shitcoin center, right? Most users <laughs> buy shitcoin. You talk to any any of the exchange heads informally, they'll tell you, yeah, like most most transactions are for are not for BTC and ETH. I don't know if fucking Dogecoin is inflation hedge. Okay, I don't think these people yeah. know. So to me, this doesn't feel very like personally. It doesn't feel like depend on the sample size. I don't think this is very very accurate. Here's another one I found that I thought was kind of cool. There's this new meta that's starting to take place that I think is going to continue to get bigger and bigger during the bear market here. Um, and it's this idea of real yield. Oftentimes, if anyone was around for the last year or two, you would have seen like multi thousand percent. Uh, APRs and APYs on yield farming, right? Deposit your tokens will give you 10,000% annualized interest, right? Uh, obviously, most of that interest was, or all that interest is being paid in the native token of that project. And obviously that project is a shit coin, right? It's not going to exist in six months. So now the meta is starting to evolve to real yield. And these are projects which have some emissions. They're giving some rewards, but they're making more money than they're giving out in rewards. And they're using the money that they're actually making to pay out those rewards. I know it sounds crazy to crypto people, but these are protocols that operate <laughs> like actual businesses. They yeah. make money. Sounds like, sounds like dividends, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's pretty wild that it took us this long to get to a point where real yield is actually important. But I think we are at that point right now. And then this thread shows a few examples of it as well. All right. Well, if they're fulfilling a real promise, that means that's token going to zero, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay so this is a mabel jang tweet that uh, i really liked it's actually a tweet to an episode of a podcast that they shot with uh, jason Choi and wangarian who together have started a angel collective called tangent they're basically they're the purest angel collective truly because they make a few concentrated bets say 15 bets a year much like we do at ftx super team uh and where we angel invest and you know we'll help projects that we like they both left their previous venture jobs so they have an interesting discussion on how you know how crypto is evolving how they find market opportunity it's a great podcast generally it's it's full of alpha but i think there are two takeaways for me on this one is where mabel says she is uh uh incredibly optimistic about Asia now that, you know, you kind of have like this regulatory crackdown in the U S uh, and uh, she, she's incredibly, uh, uh, you know, optimistic about Asia and two, um, the app layer will flourish uh, in the next cycle. And this is something we have been talking about uh, both within super team, the community, as well as we may have touched upon it on the pod. So yeah, why don't you, why don't you remind everybody who's watching what was your, uh, app protocol thesis, fat app protocol, fat app thesis. Oh, so to be clear, I did not name it that. Uh, there was a fat protocol thesis that somebody came up with in, I think, 2015, 2016. But the idea was that all the value created in crypto or most of the value would accrue to the protocol layer, uh, mm. which is the base layer of you know Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, et cetera. And that played out beautifully, right? Which we call the Alt-L1 trade effectively. 
uh, last cycle. Mm. I think that that uh, and then Hasu tweeted that maybe he quote quote tweeted and we'll put a link to that as well. Um, a, an announcement of Aave going cross chain, and now mm. the Aave is like the main app, and there's a bunch of chains around Aave where it is, as opposed to previously. It, there was Ethereum in the center and a bunch of apps around Ethereum, right? Correct, so it's correct. kind of like a fundamental shift in frame. And what it says is basically the block space is getting abundant with all these chains coming around. And mm. that makes for a world where you can have a fat app thesis, right? And crypto has this notorious tendency to do two things. One, disappoint the most number of people. Like I think if people are all positioned to take advantage of the alt L1 trade. Funds were created and seed stage funds are investing in the next big L1, Aptos, Sui and Monard and you know all these new ch- fast, super fast chains are coming up. Everyone's investing in them. I think the biggest rug pull would be like the app layer now starts to be- just go vertical and this stuff just fizzles out over time, right? So you're um, saying that apps that are really good, people yeah. will use them and it doesn't matter what chain they are on. I'm saying that in crypto, yes. Like in Web2, these things would uh, not that's, need to be discussed over a podcast. That's a crazy one. But... <laughs> that's a crazy. Because in Web2, this these apps were called a super app. You know, the ones that people really liked. And they said, hey, I'd like to do everything on this one app that I'm really used to. Shocking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So look, I mean, I, I think it would be entertaining to say the least if the alt L1 trade was not relevant at all next cycle and a bunch of apps just took off. And they became more valuable than the than the blockchains they're on. Mm. To Mabel's credit, she made another important point, which I thought was cool, which is that the whole super app culture came from Asia. Correct. So if apps are going to take off next cycle, mm. the Asian founders are very well positioned because they have a culture within Web2 of building better consumer apps than the US. This is a beam that I, that I thought was funny, you know, like... <laughs> Building in regulated industries with low margins and high barriers to entry creates inherent moat with huge dams. Permissionless products and pure play SaaS models are the only way to build quickly and get venture outcomes. So like that's like the mainstream wisdom, right? Permissionless products, pure play SaaS models, they're software only. Uh, you should do them because they're like software can ship infinitely. Whereas, mm. you know, building in regulated industries with low margins, an example of this is Uber, right? Like that's mm. part of why, and, or even some of the crypto businesses are like this, right? Where you're building with, you know, in regulated industry with really low margins. The point is that high barrier to entry means that you need a 10x founder to make that business work, work. in that industry. David Sachs, who said something similar on the All In podcast last week, that they just don't invest in anything that's non-software because the type of person it takes to make a hybrid physical digital business work is just has to be a 10x founder because it's harder to operate in the real world, which is more regulated. Yes, SaaS is easy, but anybody can compete with you. But doing this is much harder because if you do crack it, it's harder to compete with you because the barrier to entry is high. All right. Uh, our guy, Udi, back with another just banger tweet. One of the funniest accounts on Twitter. Everyone should go follow him. Uh, my friend wears a six-figure Rolex literally anywhere he goes and wears it to the bathroom. And I swear he never bothered to set the time on it. It just shows some random time. Anyways, so NFTs have no u- utility. <laughs> I thought this was hilarious. I mean, like all the time people are shitting on NFTs um, and being like, oh, why would anyone want it? It's so silly. And then they forget these kinds of people who wear, which by the way, I do as well. I forget to set the time on my watch all the time. It's a status thing. It's an aesthetic thing. It's a belonging thing. It's all these other types of things, uh, which are utility. But if you just narrowly define utility as like, does it you know, make French fries? Like, no, obviously it doesn't do that. Most of the valuable things in the world have a different type of utility than pure like action-based utility. Okay, this is hilarious. Wearing a backpack that mines Bitcoin. A, that's cool. It's kind of funny, but cool. But I thought the quote tweet on this was the funniest. Concerned you might get laid at any point in your life? Try the Bitcoin mining backpack. Guaranteed to protect your virginity. (laughs) Man. If Satoshi isn't dead, well, after seeing this, he's definitely dead. Okay. (laughs) Like he began this whole thing as like, oh, we need one like censorship resistant blockchain that can, you know. And so that people, people would mine it in like remote parts, parts of, the of the world where it'd be hard to <laughs> shut it down. Yeah. And no, like it'd be so geographically distributed yeah, that yeah. you wouldn't be able to even find the mining farm. Yeah. Here's a gentleman <laughs> who. Fucking put it, <laughs> wearing it like. An Along Arctic with his passport bag. carries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people are asking questions also like, hey, is there space for a water bottle in this backpack? Like, <laughs> Tamar's birthday. Happy birthday, Tamar. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. 
Is there any insight in this tweet that you've selected? <laughs> Not really. Just want to really. wish Tamar for wish being Tamar. a wonderful colleague. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna Cash be... somehow figured out a way to send her flowers while she's in Berlin. Um, <laughs> We're going to link her uh, Twitter in the... All the tweets are going to be in the description so you guys can go wish her as well. Awesome. Okay. That was uh, probably the most insightful tweet I read today. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Gajesh ships first version of the XNFTs. That's what they look like. It's, I think, a quick swap app. If you guys want to know what XNFTs are, we did an episode with Armani, who's like a super dev. What did he make? He made a quick swap app. Yeah, it looks like basically a swapping. Yeah, it's, a, it's an XNFT that lets you swap between assets. Cool. Yeah, but what's cool and interesting there is that you can swap between multiple assets at the same time, it looks like. So you can swap one NFT plus some soul for another NFT plus some soul. Nice. Man, Gajesh is having a baller time in Bahamas, isn't it? Yeah, he's having a great time. He keeps uh, texting me saying, oh, I'm in uh, uh, SBF's house today and I'm really nervous, uh, but I'm having great dinner. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Do you think when SBF became a billionaire, he was like, you know, my life is going to be mostly dinners with 14-year-old kids. Did yeah. that come across? <laughs> that sounds really uh, inappropriate, but... <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Cash. Thanks. And definitely don't delete this one, Jadeep. Keep it. Keep this in twice. Okay. <laughs> back to back. Just play it back to back. Hey. Do you think when SPF became a billionaire, he was like, you know, my life is going to be mostly dinners with fourteen-year-old kids. Mostly dinners with fourteen-year-old kids. This is a really cool submission for the Solana Hackathon. I didn't want to pick one that was a Super Team submission, obviously, because we are biased. By the way, Super Team uh, members submitted 10 projects in total out of a total of 700. Oh, wow. 11, actually. 11, okay, there we go. Nice. What is that as a percentage cash? I can't do math anymore. I never Oof. could, to be honest. Yeah, me either. It's like it, 2%, 1.5%, yeah. something like that. Half 2%, yeah. Close to 2%, yeah. Anyway, so I picked one that I, you know, that wasn't part of Super Team. It's a two-minute video. We'll link the video down below. But what you see here is them executing a transaction to send some USDC because between Solana Ethereum and Solana. Ryan here. So I'll be charging Ryan here. And he'll be paying me from his ETH wallet. And then I just scan the QR code here. It pulls up with his address, the amount I need to pay, and then what the reason is that he entered. I hit pay and then just give it some time. We're essentially moving uh, liquidity from the Ethereum network uh, over into Solana and paying for this transaction in roughly about 10 seconds. So I got payment complete. Uh, this shows the address of where the payment went to. I hit OK. And I got a payment and, complete. And so did Chris. And you'll see that my value decremented by a dollar, which is how much Chris request, requested. All, All right. right. Last and week. And the final today. one. Nice. <laughs> I don't know why. Just this. <laughs> you just like the photo of the dude in the suit. Yeah, I think <laughs> Super Team Intern is hilarious, by the way. I don't know what you, if you guys agree. I think it's just the guy, the guy is unfazed by his surroundings and yeah. just walking into the sunset <laughs> with glory. Yeah. That <laughs> confidence. <laughs> well, congrats to everybody who did submit. Uh, big props to all the developers and engineers who actually put you know, several weeks of work into submitting a project and I hope uh, they win some prizes at the end of this and raise their seed rounds and go on to build cool stuff. Actually, let's do one thing. Let's link Let's link all the big super team projects that, that submitted yeah. uh, in the description as well. So you guys can go check them out. On that note, thank you very much for joining us on the first like, like a different format that we're trying. Let us know what you think of the new format. If you guys enjoy this, we'll continue doing this. On that note, see you. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. This is welcome to Super Team. Random things we thought were cool on Twitter.